Exaggerated effects you can see in patients that have altered cardiac output, and I'm not going to go into the, the details as to why that happens, but when you have alterations in cardiac output or when you have another really profound sedative analgesic on board, you may see the drug have a much greater effect than what you would anticipate, which is, again, why do, how do we administer our intravenous anesthetics? Titrate to effect, right? That's my like, adage on that. Titration to effect. And that way, some of these exaggerated effects shouldn't come around and bite you. Um, slow action of onset, again, can be related to either not injecting it properly, so it's not really a reaction to the drug, it's just you didn't do something right, or again, alteration of the cardiac outputs, arrhythmias can happen. Arrhythmias can happen in association with the drugs that we use. Again, it's not a reaction associated with the drug that's unaccountable, it's just that sometimes happens. For example, like we just had a case um, last week that uh, dog's totally normal, nothing's wrong with it, it's a uh, Newfoundlander. Um, being anesthetized for a TPLO, we induced the dog with ketamine, and then we noticed that it was really tachycardic, and we were like, huh, isn't that odd? And so, you know, we did a few things to try and bring down the heart rate through vagal maneuvers and so forth, brought down the heart rate because we were a little suspicious there might have been something else going on. Dog went into atrial fibrillation secondary to the ketamine administration. Happens. The atrial fibrillation went away by the next day. So, again, it can happen. So just be aware. These drugs do things. So those are the sort of drug reactions or some of the more common ones we see and some of the ones that sometimes it'll be like, never, never use this drug in the patient again because he had a reaction. Well, was it a reaction or was it just a common side effect that happens with the drug that uh, we hadn't seen a lot of? Um, airway problems are another area that we can run into some complications. Um, you know, obstructions, regurgitation, you can cause trauma by trying to intubate them and laryngospasm. One of the things about intubating cats, for example, I'm very anal about is it's like, don't force the tube into a cat. Be patient, wait until that larynx opens, and then pop your tube through. I mean, laryngospasm is not a fun situation to deal with in a cat. And the thing is, even if you get your tube into the cat after it laryngospasms, when you go to wake that cat up, it's going to probably still have some residual laryngospasm, which is going to be a bit of a problem. So, you know, be a little bit careful um, intubating. Another thing that I would really encourage you guys to do, and I know that like everyone is like, oh, I don't need a laryngoscope to intubate because, you know, I can do it. And, yeah, well, I can do it too. But a laryngoscope will really help you in some instances. In those patients where you're likely to run into a problem, using a laryngoscope will help you. So, you know, having a trauma patient or something like that who's got some trauma around the head, tumor masses around the mouth, the brachycephalic breeze, laryngoscopes are very useful and worth the money that you invest into them. The other thing is sometimes people will go, well, I don't, I don't, I know I don't need it for this case, so I don't use it when I need it. The thing I argue is, you know what, you've got to be really good at using a laryngoscope and using it more and more and more in all your patients makes you better. The first time someone uses a laryngoscope, it's like they're using two left hands. They can never sort of hold the tongue and the tube and everything else. So um, do do that, okay? Um, as far as regurgitation goes, that is uh, something that can occur. Um, fortunately, we don't really see that a lot. It'll often happen during the anesthesia, um, where we'll see gastroesophageal reflux, and I'll just talk a little bit about why that happens. But we rarely see this. Um, but again, if you have a patient with megaesophagus or a patient that's going to be predisposed to re regurgitation, you want to take precautions to manage it. Um, so now I'm going to just move on to uh, maintenance complications. Um, and this is actually one of the fun things about being an anesthesiologist. I get to do all kinds of species. Um, I've done lots of bears. I've done um, some elephants, rhinos, giraffes, um, lots of really neat things that I get involved in. Um, and what's interesting when you do large carnivores, again, here's the stories, um, they're dangerous, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm just saying, they're dangerous. Um, and they're pretty scary. And when you get up close to one of these things and you're up close to the head, it's like their heads, no kidding, are like this big around and the teeth are massive. Um, and this was a great big uh, brown bear. And uh, it's a little disconcerting the first time you anesthetize one of these because there's also a dude standing there around the corner with a great big gun ready to shoot the bear should it wake up, which it's a safety thing. But then I'm like, dude, does that guy with the gun know what he's doing with that gun? Because if he misses that bear, it gets me. So, uh, but yeah, you get to do lots of neat things too. So let's talk about some of the maintenance problems. Um, hypotension is probably the number one thing that you guys are going to run into. I would say that uh, our techs probably spend 50% of the time managing this complication of all the complications they manage. And they have to be able to recite that back to me verbatim how they're going to do it and go through all the steps with me every time. It must drive them crazy when they first start training because I'm like, and how again do you manage hypotension? Yep, yep, yep. Oh, what about that? Um, so it's great. But um, 
First, I think we have to recognize what hypotension is, and hopefully in most of your practices, you guys are monitoring blood pressure. Um, super, super important, right? Um, ultimately, why are we measuring blood pressure? It's not to measure the pressure just for the sake of knowing what the pressure is, but ultimately what we want is we want to ensure that we have oxygen tissue blood flow, oxygen going to the tissues, right? I mean, that's why we're doing it. It's not the best indicator of the amount of blood flow going to the tissues, but it's the best indicator we have that's non-invasive. Cardiac output, so measuring the amount of blood actually coming out of the heart would be a much better assessment, but it's not easy to measure non-invasively, okay? So we do measure that. Um, what we consider a low blood pressure would be a mean arterial pressure less than 60 and a systolic pressure less than 90. That's what we typically consider hypotension, and it's at that point that we start managing the hypotension and treating them. If the blood pressures are greater than that, I don't worry about it. Now, one of the big things about Dopplers, how many of you guys use Dopplers in your practice? Okay, be aware that in the CAT, the Doppler actually most closely correlates with the mean blood pressure in anesthetized CATs. So when your CAT is anesthetized and you're using a Doppler on it, it's most closely correlated with the mean blood pressure. So if you're getting a reading of 90 on your Doppler in an anesthetized CAT, that's more closely correlated to a mean blood pressure of 90. That's not the same case in awake cats. It's just anesthetized cats. That's, what, that's the only ones that's been studied in. So in anesthetized cats with a Doppler, usually I'm trying to maintain the blood pressures above sort of 60 to 70, okay? Even though we always think of the Doppler as being measuring systolic blood pressure, it's actually closer to the mean in anesthetized cats. And there's a, a good study that was done out of Saskatoon that showed that very clearly to compare to invasive blood pressure me measurements. Now, if you're using a non-invasive blood pressure monitor, like a Cardell, um, so one of the ones that just monitors routinely and prints out the systolic, diastolic, and mean, that will give you the true mean value for the most part, okay? Although there's a lot of differences among the quality of the different non-invasive blood pressure monitors, which I really don't have time to go into. Um, but if you're using one of those, then it is truly mean. Um, I just, because the, the whole, when we start treating blood pressure, you know, the way I teach it and the way I want the technicians I work with to learn it is I need them to understand what are the factors that contribute, contribute, to, treat, or contribute to creating blood pressure. I don't, it's not good enough just to say, rattle off the numbers and you tell me what it is. I need them to understand the physiology of what's going on in the cardiovascular system. And I simplify it out quite a bit. I mean, the cardiovascular system is just a fancy pump and a series of hoses. That's really all it is. And the hoses create resistance. And basically what you have is you have a pump that pumps a certain volume of blood out into the circulatory system. And then the tone that the circulatory system is under determines its resistance. And you'll get a pressure being generated from that. That's all it is. That's, that's really all the, the cardiovascular... No, that's... I can see Marco over there cringing. <laughs> that's all the cardiovascular system does? Well, from an anesthesiologist's point of view, that's it. No. Um, but no, it's a good way to think about it because if you think about what a pump does, there's only a few factors that you can change to change the volume of blood that a pump or the volume of fluid that a pump is putting out. Right? You can either you can either increase the amount per stroke of blood, or you can increase the number of strokes. Right? So the, the volume of strokes, we prefer, or the volume of blood with each ejection, we consider that the stroke volume. And the heart rate, obviously, is heart rate. And when you combine those two, you get your cardiac output, essentially, right? And then your systemic vascular resistance is what the heart has to pump against. And that's what's going to create your pressure. So if you have a very vasodilated patient, well, of course, your blood pressures are lower. If you vasoconstrict your patient, the blood pressures are higher. And it's not always good to try and raise blood pressures through vasoconstriction. Because if you vasoconstrict all your tissues, are you getting oxygen to your tissues? Not so much. It's best to focus on trying to optimize this pump function, so by increasing stroke volume and heart rate. And we do this in a couple of ways. And I always go back to this diagram. And I, I won't go through it in a lot of detail. Um, but this diagram basically shows you what the components are that contribute to stroke volume and cardiac output and ultimately blood pressure. So cardiac output is like the pump, the pump function. And I already told you it's a combination of heart rate and stroke volume. And then if you look at stroke volume and the factors that contribute to stroke volume, it's contractility, so the force with which the heart is contracting. So we could use drugs that would increase the contractility of the heart, increase our stroke volume, cardiac output, and up goes our blood pressure. 
the afterload actually impairs our stroke volume. And afterload is sort of equivalent to your systemic vascular resistance, and we're not going to even look at that one. Preload is the amount of blood or the pressure of blood coming back to the heart. And if it's greater, then it sort of allows the heart to fill more fully, and you get a larger stroke volume. So we, do, we manage this aspect. Luciotropia is the ability of the heart to relax, to accept blood into it. And we don't really manipulate this a lot during anesthesia because it's kind of hard to do. Um, and also, we don't really have a lot of patients that we would see that would have poor relaxation other than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy cats. Um, but it's the ability of the heart to relax to accept blood into it, okay? And then, of course, heart rate. If you go to a too high a heart rate, it decreases your stroke volume. So I'm not, let's, not, let's sort of not think about this too much down there because it gets confusing. And then systemic vascular resistance, again, is the resistance which it's that the heart is pumping against. So how do we manage hypotension? And I'll sort of refer back to how it addresses each of these components of blood pressure determinant. Very, very first thing. What's the very, very, very first thing you should do if your patient is hypotensive? Check the anesthetic depth, yes. But even before that, you should always, and I, you know what, you never are going to go wrong by saying check the anesthetic depth or check the patient, because in my mind, you should be doing that all the time. That should be always going on. But also double check the accuracy of the reading and that it's actually what you think it is. There are spurious readings, and you don't want to start being really aggressive about treating blood pressure until you know the reading's accurate. So double checking your reading, absolutely. And then assess your, well, then these could be the same, and really... I don't care whether you say this one first or this one first. It doesn't matter to me because you should always be assessing your patient. But one of the things that we can do is if I get this reading back and, yes, it's accurate, my dog has got a mean blood pressure of 50, now I'm going to check and see can I lighten my patient at all because obviously the anesthetics are massive cardiovascular depressants and are one of the leading causes of hypotension in our patients. So I'll actually try and reduce the anesthetic depth. I may give them an anesthetic sparing drug like an opioid, which has very little effects on the cardiovascular system. Um, I also look at what the procedure is happening. Uh, a lot of times surgeons, especially if they're in intra-abdominal procedures, will be clumsy around with their fingers and they'll be pushing on the caudal vena cava or messing around with stuff which would, can momentarily decrease our blood pressure. So I ask about that. Maybe they just nick the aorta. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen, but uh, I did see somebody nick the uh, carotid once putting it in an esophagostomy tube. That was really exciting. Um, so obviously I knew why my patient was becoming hypotensive. So I do that, check the depth, lighten them up, get them to appropriate plane of anesthesia. Another thing, and these are sort of the very, and I guess I, I put these under first response, because all three of these things you should have done. These things, things should just be boom, 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 check the heart rate, right? Because if you look back here on this slide, one of the things you see is that the heart rate, by increasing the heart rate, we can increase the cardiac output, which will increase our blood pressure, right? So check the heart rate. If you've got a bradycardia in your patient, treat it and manage it. It's easy to treat, number one. It's an anticholinergic. It's super easy to treat them. Um, and for me, a low heart rate in a big or medium-sized dog would be less than 60. A small dog, probably less than 80. And in a cat, arguably around 100 to 120, I would consider it bradycardic, and I would treat it. So if I have hypotension and bradycardia, I treat the bradycardia. And a lot of times, then the hypotension goes away because now I've brought up the cardiac output and everything's good. Now, if it doesn't, then I move on to the sort of second response or second, second line therapies. And the first thing I would do is start with a fluid bolus 